Hey, 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 one more RWI touchdown. Uh, a pleasure to have here Stefan and Laurin. Um, as usual, as I always say, we have loads of stuff, of interesting stuff to, to share. Besides those interesting stuff that we have been having all sorts of conversations around, right? So let's begin for a quick, a quick, a really quick check-in just to see how how each of you guys are coming uh, for today's touchdown. Beginning, beginning with you, Stefan. How are you, how are you doing, my friend? Doing good, doing good. Um, making progress on different fronts, so that's good. Um, we're just coming out of the... Uh, we're really coming into springs. All the leaves are coming through on the trees, so it's lovely. So that's good. Um, and I had a good session. I, I'm going to have a summer student, an uh, interactive media designer, working with me for nine weeks. I'm just looking for a summer student to do that. So can help start doing some stuff with Gather Town with them as well, which should be good. So I've got to make use of those nine weeks. Um, and yeah, I want to start really getting to grips with some of these um, interactive activities. So I look forward to seeing how that can move forward, um, both in activities with people in person and also online. So um, I think you saw my notes about that, you know, some of the question of how to set all of that up. I had a nice meeting with um, Susan, actually. No, sorry, um, not Susan. I had a, a nice meeting with Sarah Hutton from IOPA. I bumped into her on the IOPA, and she got she had a really good chat. And um, really, really interesting to know that I didn't know yeah. that she, we had the opportunity to meet her. Yeah, uh, did it happen during this week? Yeah, because I, during I, the I call, well, they had a call. TV. They had an IOPA call, um, meeting. Yeah, but, or something. So yeah. I joined their call, uh, got chatting to her there, and then I had another follow up. And uh, I might try and do a, uh, I'm going to do an activity with her. And um, she's good. She's into live. She's got a background in librarianship, but she's um, also getting interested in how the embodied understanding and knowing is. So really good. Um, and I think that can start to, you know, trying to find this way to bridge between more codified ontological ways of describing the world and jumping off into the uh, more experiential kind of action methods and infusion space and um, like I say I've got some thoughts about how I might be doing that so that's something when, I should have uh, a chat with you about Venetius. Um, Stefan when that when that happened because I always say to TB hey when you're going to gather again with IOPA please tag me or or you know yeah ping me I, I haven't been into I haven't been into gather yet with Sarah, but I and I have but I'd like to use that for the map of meaning. But I think it could be used for other stuff. I think also use it actually in person so that um, virtually in person the hybrid. So get someone like we did that time with Tiberius. You know, in the person's room, do the activity, be facilitated, have that experience, and then bring that back. And what I'm really interested in is what it means. I think this is a good discipline is what does it mean to find the way from the customary discourse for a particular group that we're interested in? What's the ways to distill that into maybe grounding it into where they're at in different times so that you could go somewhere like Infusion? And then what can you also work out to do when you come back again? Um, so that it can be instrumentalized in some particular way. Um, and I think that is in itself a new area of consideration, right? Because it's inherently transdisciplinary because you got whoever it is as a participant and their own stuff, which will be what it is. You've got the process of understanding knowledge as is discussed consciously, what it means to go into this more embodied awareness, how you come back with that, and again, what, what we can now use from that, that presumably was something that we weren't able to do before. You don't bring back knowledge, or you can, but the, the knowledge that you want is the knowledge you couldn't have got already. Because if you can get it already, well, you've, you've, we've got a fairly 
quick and dirty way of doing it already, right? We don't need to go off on some other route. The question is, where can't you go? It's because there's too many disciplines involved. It's beyond conscious awareness. It's it's too much of a um, subtlety. Um, so that's the questions that we're at. And some of the same questions that sort of comes up with um, some of Lauren's work as well. You know, there's some delicate pieces in there. Um, and I, and I, so I was talking to Sarah about that particularly about that idea of where we are. So we know where we might be in these landscapes, but we can't necessarily articulate what that is. And that idea of going between what stuff is, which is basically what knowledge is, and where we have knowing about stuff, which generally isn't codified and isn't held in a university textbook, that moving backwards and forwards is where there's something rich. And of course, it would be different as well, depending on the land and the culture, right? And Brazil has a very much, I learned a very much, I changed the way I thought about a lot of things after doing a workshop with um, uh, on Hotel Madeira in London, and they were a group from Rio de Janeiro. And they were working with indigenous uh, Brazilian dancers. And one of the things they were really teaching with the capoeira was to push down into the ground. So in the West, it's very much about jumping. There it's like feet going down, down, down. And that, that in itself changes a huge amount of things in terms of what you're trying to do with your body in space. Um, really interesting group, actually. Pretty crazy, but interesting. Uh, <laughs> so I'll pass you over to, to maybe Lauren's going to go next if, if, she's, uh, if she's OK. Yeah, I'll bring her too. And um, I actually wanted to talk with you a little bit, um, Stephen, about, um, I wanted to make a module, um, like a listening module to lead people through the basics of listening uh, to each other. And I was wondering if the uh, clean language stuff would be good for that. Yeah, uh, yeah, and there's so actually a lady who's got a thing called the listening post. She does clean language and her thing is called the listening post. So basically okay. people just come to her and all she does is listen, maybe ask some clean yeah. questions. So yeah, so what you're saying, she might have a little book out on it as well. I'll have a look if I've got, there's a book out that she's done. I, um, actually, you should all sign up. There's gonna be the Metaforum coming up. There's the clean language uh, conference coming up in about two or three months. And uh, really? it's got all is things- it online to or is it at some place? That one's, no, it's all been held online. But they do like a day where it's all things, all things to do with clean language and metaphors and all the different ways that metaphors, uh, sorry, clean language gets applied is being looked at. So, but this one lady, what the, let me just look up her name now. It's, um, but yeah, I hear what you're saying. That clean language is a great way to, it's about listening. What one thing he says is the tragedy, David Grove used to say the tragedy is mostly when people are having a conversation. And often this is fine in everyday conversation because we keep things moving forward. But often people are, while the other person's talking, people are preparing their own response. They're preparing what their stuff is that they should respond with. They're not actually with the other person's stuff. Yeah, her name is Grace uh, Richmond, if I, if I, if I forget. Grace something, that's reach, reach mind or reach, reach uh, song. Let's have a look. Um, Judy Reese, there's Judy Reese, but there's uh, the one that does the listening post. Um, yeah, it's, it's uh, Grace, I think. I, 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 I heard of her. Oh, yeah, and, it's, and that's the clean language one, is it? Step the essential listening post, listening. The, uh, let's just have a look. Well, I, I found it here. Did you give me sure. a list of that? Yeah, go for that. Show me. Did you put it in the chat? Uh, yes, I'm going to put it in the chat, but I'm going to show, I'm going to share the screen. Oh, yeah, share the screen. Let's go put because I couldn't find it. Wait a minute. Here we go. Oh, that one. Uh, oh, it's not this one. Yeah, no. you're right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, this is another thing. Uh, so go on, man. But that's probably, that was probably also, a, I wonder if you got the name from there. But, I but it's, like, it's, it's an interesting book. 
<laughs> yeah, I know. It does look an interesting book. 1929 as well. It'll be very interesting to see. That actually be interesting yes. to see what they say. 1929, man. The Disney wow. Post is a story of a marriage as seen through. This is something that I think even, uh, I think that Laurie would love to, to put her eyes yeah. on. Uh, through the eyes of the couple's domestic staff. <laughs> the Disney Post. That actually be fascinating. <laughs> Yes, uh, yeah, it's interesting because it was already indexed here in my in my in my search engine. Yeah, uh, I, I maybe stumble upon this uh, a while ago, and I didn't know. No, I think that's a, actually. You know what? We should save that. We should we should get that book and do we uh, see what it's all about. Be well, kind of uh, interesting. anyway, I'm going to put it in the in the chat for you guys to take a look. Yeah, put that in the chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Maybe it's the. But it yeah, might not be the uh, listening I, post. I it might be the listening. It, but I, I forgot her name. I think I, I, I thought that was this this person, Grace, but it, it isn't. No. Um, let me just have a look. Let's have a look. It. Um... It's something, it's the listening, I'm sure it's called the listening something. It's, it's not showing up, so it's kind of interesting. I'll have to ask people on the Clean Language web, web, um, Facebook page. Anyway, carry on, Lauren. <laughs> We're diverted. <laughs> <laughs> you got us interested, yeah, though. Yeah, anyway, I just wanted to kind of explore that, like what you could do to, um, uh, and I've been also kind of thinking this week about um like having these like um mini labs modules uh in a modular structure so that you could you know um they would be like discrete actions like one hour two hour um mini labs and there would be like a listening lab so you just can run a thing like if if you're having problems of communication, you can go in the listening lab and then follow these instructions because sometimes there are these methodologies that are effective, but there's a high, there's a learning curve to actually learn them and facilitate them. So I wanted to see if we could break down something like clean language into a decentralized thing where each person could take on like a couple roles that would be easy to learn. They could learn them in like, you know, 15 minutes or something and then just do that role. And it, it would like, you know, you don't have to read the whole book and like facilitate, like it would just make it super easy to jump in there without a lot of um, overhead. Yeah, so I was just wondering right. you can how do to that. do that. Yeah, you can do that. I mean, what you might find on that one is there's um they call them mini models so i got some advice from because i was at the developing group in london who like oh. developed stuff for clean language so i was trying to talk to them about infusion space right this was about right seven eight years ago so he was saying like like he said oh you know and at that time i was still developing he's like oh it sounds like you're trying to explain this to yourself as much as to me right which at that time i probably was more <laughs> right because i was just trying to get my head around what this whole thing was um uh -huh. But one thing he also said, though, is what they've done with clean language is they probably have a similar problem is like you've got it was using therapy, but when they're applying it in other ways, it's like they said that they've got the developing group. So which I worked out what that was. I didn't know at that time is basically developing all the like this is the theories that can support the new developments in clean language. You've got the clean language, which is a whole load of modeling processes which you can train the facilitators in. And then he right. has mini models what they call the mini models, which is basically what the participants need to know for certain okay. things. So what they have is they have a, like a clean feedback model where they ask you, they have a clean um, scoping, they have a clean, so there, you know, you're, you're it's much more bounded, right? It's like, right. you're not learning clean language per se, or you're not even learning a whole field of modeling which could be used in lots of different ways in therapy. And you need to therefore know quite a lot of different things, right? To know where it could go and what could happen and how to deal with it. 
here it's like this is this type of activity and the main thing is what does the participant need to know so they just need to know and you call it, and notice they call it a mini module not modeling right so there you're just bounding it to model and if you want to do more modeling or go deeper then it could be that having done that you could just do a session like I could even facilitate or I could get other people from clean language connected in as well. You know, we could do something where we take someone deeper into something. But what you're trying to do is get as far as you can by just giving them these core skills. And generally speaking, you can give people three questions to do most mm -hmm. of the heavy lifting. They, okay. they, they always say this. There's two developing questions, um, which are basically what when someone says something, you ask them what kind of. Uh-huh. And is there anything else about? Basically, they're the two developing questions. Okay. And that can get you a long way. The only thing that comes so you can so yeah, sure you can do that. But I, I mean, I actually seen you can do quite a lot as well if you if we were to set it up using Chat GPT actually, because it's scanned <laughs> all these books on clean language and it is a language thing, which is right up its back alley or whatever. Okay. Back, up its alley. And um but um so you can even get something simple set up in something like an LNM, which is bounded, and it might it might even help with that. Um, the there's one thing. Uh, on. Chibi, Chibi, Chibi is here. Hey, Chibi. Oh, cool. Chibi is here with us. Hey, yeah, Chibi. yeah, no problem, no problem. Okay, we're talking yeah. about uh, David Grove, Grove's uh, clean language uh, therapy technique. I, I don't yeah. know Chibi, if you know about it. Yeah, it's very interesting. So go on, go on, Stefan. Yeah, and it gets applied now in coaching, and it's been used as, as an interview method. They just book, they published a book on clean language for qualitative research. Um, but one thing I was going to ask you, Lauren, and this is something that I've been really thinking about, is I spent the last twenty years getting more and more into this open dialogue, people exploring all this sort of creating trust in groups and trying to yeah. find ways forward. Um, but I've also had the harsh reality of learning how to negotiate mm -hmm. <laughs> from encountering the legal system, um, right. which is a very different thing, right? You know, having to take mm -hmm. a position in, in many ways, doing some of the very different, you know, it's almost the antithesis. It's not quite the antithesis because there's still in theory a search for truth. I mean, there is the option in the legal system of just plain silly buggers, pardon my French. But let's assume that we're only going to go into the legal system to try and work in a relatively honest way. Even okay. then, you still have to take a position often and have a negotiation from a positionality. Whereas in more dialogical stuff, even though you implicitly have where you come from, um, the clean language particularly is coming from a place of curiosity. If you're right. curious, if you're interested, you want to know, then this can work really well. Um, and, and especially if you want to get someone into their metaphor, if someone is in a, a defensive state or in a state of um, highly cognitive gameplay, which often we need to be right and, and everything in some ways, when we're in a particular structured way of performing deliverables, we're in that mode, you're mm -hmm. less likely to get clean language being that useful, right? Because there's a, the, the point of clean language is you're trying to find out and go beyond and particularly if you want to use the clean language to open up a metaphor you won't get a metaphor particularly unless the person is able to go there does that make sense it's not like if you and, and what's that like well what that's like is what they call autogenic what that's like genuinely is what it is me taking in my feelings of how i sense myself to be as i think about it and expressing that in metaphor form so it's not out there waiting to be had. It's not like what it's like in terms of like, if you hear a response coming back, which sounds kind of like something you could read in a textbook, then you know the uh -huh. response is a construction, a narrative that they put together based on what they think it should be. But what it's like is just what it happens in the moment. And that's a different thing. Now, it's not necessarily that you're going to be doing metaphors, but it, it could be something that um, I don't know, it depends on your application, right? But and how deeply you want to go and stuff. But um, that could be useful for people. Um, and I've actually got a friend I might ask you to talk to. She's been through this issue with Facebook, whereas this guy okay. posted on Facebook a picture of her 
and she's gone to court over it and everything and um might be someone that you might um you might actually have some ideas about how that relates to the tech world um, i feel like you've told me about her before but i don't remember the story yeah well basically she had this ex-boyfriend and he posted a picture of her as if it was like a psycho movie photoshopped <laughs> in and then she he posted it on the main pub here in niagara on the lake which you know has two million tourists going through that town and that's where she was a piano teacher and then it got uh -huh. posted on the mayor's facebook page and they're all denying that they knew anything about it yet yeah, somehow it got allowed on there and um, oh my god <laughs> yeah so she went to she took them to court and it's five years later and she's still trying to do it and what? she's self-representing as well oh my god yeah so it's been a bit of a mad nightmare so so she's still going but she i don't know it's kind of like um yeah and the guy had gone off to ukraine as well so therefore she couldn't serve papers easily so, oh my god yeah so <laughs> but it sort of shows the problem and facebook just won't facebook just kept playing on hanging on and hanging on right so they haven't they've, they've got the facebook's got their own lawyers on their side oh. uh so she's up against that and they, they uh, just is it does she just want the picture taken down or what she she they she wanted it taken down or well, she wants compensation as well for okay. loss of work because she lost her job she said she couldn't work in the town anymore because it kind of defamation her character oh she, is she suing facebook then or yeah him or what? she's suing facebook and she's suing her ex as well for posting it because she didn't know about it she also wants to know it's definitely all down and there's nothing on the servers okay. um, and that no one else could be reposting it so some of that stuff is yeah so it gets a little bit into the technicalities of social media um, wow. okay <laughs> anyway, um, but anyway yeah it's a little bit complicated but but it's kind of relevant to what you're talking about because this is the sort of stuff that happens it's sort of revenge postings of women's character you know right yeah I was just, uh, yeah, I was just wondering, like, what uh, we could do to facilitate, like, if there's a group of us, like, uh, like we're doing here on Zoom, like, you know, there are like four of us. Um, how could we create a practice of listening by having, like, how could each of us take on, like, a role, like, I don't know, and be more uh, mindful. So it isn't necessarily for this group, but I'm thinking of, um uh, this kind of situation, um, mm. and so I, I was just wondering, like, how would you farm out those roles? Like, what could each person's role be? Because there's stuff like you, you know, maybe one person watches the body language or something like that, or you know, another person oh. makes sure the language is clean and that everyone is understanding each other or something or you know there there's stuff like that i'm just wondering what tasks there are and how you could kind of engineer better conversations yeah uh yeah i mean i suppose there's a question of what kind of conversation is that conversation right so again a good a good open dialogue that's just flowing and everything else would be a very bad negotiation position <laughs> so yeah, exactly yeah. You know what i mean so so um so of course and, i'm and talking here about curiosity like conversations of curiosity yeah it's curious open sort of um and maybe even this ability to move from one to another that can be quite interesting maybe the ability to move and be open to listening within a negotiation perspective and then listening within a curious they do do something called modeling. So some of them have come out of the world of NLP, which is a mod does does basically models experts at how they work. So you can do that. You could model people's patterns as they do stuff and you can self model. Um, but it might be that case of actually using clean language and some other 
well, particularly clean language and maybe what's meaningful um, in all of that. That's where the map of meaning might be quite useful. The map of meaningful life could use that mm -hmm. to say, okay, where I, I'm, I'm, I'm really into the map of meaningful life um, as a way into that because you can find out well, where is the, um, where might we want to then distill down what's going on there. So it might be, is it how we understand the dynamic between having our unity with ourselves mm -hmm. and inte sorry, integrity with ourselves and our own integrity and being of service to others. So you could have that dynamic. Okay, okay, we work within that dynamic. And then within that dynamic, what's happening? Um, I'd have to think about it. Maybe I think it's best to come from the perspective of where it's being used. Because in clean language, they've got clean language for coaching, they've got clean language for mm -hmm. therapy, they've got clean language for research, and they've got clean language for systemic organizational work. The kind so of I guess I'm, I guess I, um, I'm interested in um, the listening and how to improve people's listening Listen. skills. So if one person is talking, how do you make them feel listened to? Like, what are the things mm -hmm. that you do? to make them feel like, wow, someone really is getting me. Mm. Okay. So in that no, case, like that, for example, that, for example, mm. like if someone, if it's, if it's like listening mode, you're not like, Hey, I've got a solution to your problem or let me go fix it here. Here's some like great insight for you or some advice. Mm. That's mm -hmm. what I'm, that's what I'm trying to say. Just like, shut the fuck up and listen like coach yeah that could be okay so well that one could be so the idea yeah, you, is so one no, person that, that, talk you, you, that just literally would be that would be more like that would literally be more like the therapeutic model it's not it's not the therapeutic model isn't about is not therapy in the normal sense of therapy because the point is that you don't right. put your stuff in there normal therapy is about fitting someone to the model that the therapist has got this is not about that this is about right. the person's self-modeling. So the, the, the process is called symbolic modeling. Um, okay. And generally speaking, the thing with the symbolic modeling and the clean language is generally speaking, you try, they recommend use only three to five questions, maybe even three questions. The thing is, if you're in a group setting or it depends on the setting, and unless you're actually okay for going that much deeper and that much more psychoactive, you talk, you, you, you could kind of, um, you may not ask them what it's like. There's a slight risk of um, using clean in that way. So it might be that we mix it in with something like nonviolent communication and mix it yeah. between the two because clean language goes like, you know, so someone could say, you know, that you're talking about something, you're going deeper and you say, OK, and where did that come from? Where does that come from? Dot, 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 dot. And they say, well, that comes from when I was uh, I witnessed that someone kill my friend. And I, I, you know, bang, it's gone. You know, it can go it can go in all sorts of like that generally might be where it seems to come from. Right. But it may not be that container is ready for that. Right. Because. It depends just how deep you want to go, how much it moves. So if it moves into the listening and we say, okay, this actually is going to move into like a deeper sense of trust and we're going to, you know, I mean, people take care of themselves no matter how much they reveal, but um, generally speaking, um, yeah, it, it, it can take you into quite a deep um, mode. So what they tend to do is with coaching, it tends to be more about what you would like to have happen. So the coaching mode, the way they get coaching from doing that is they talk about what would you like to have happen and what would be the thing. And that tends to bring the metaphors out around the body. Right. And then if you start to say, what's that like? And it starts to go more trauma related. You tend to find things happen inside the body. It happened to me, okay. actually, because I was up in Ottawa and we had to do a guided visual visualization. They were doing this thing at an arts conference in Ottawa. And, the, and I was just laying back. So I took this guy with me and I was just taking him into it. And I was saying, oh, and what's that like? I use clean language and just sort of people were just doing a general talk through. Right. But I actually use the clean language questions. And I go, and what's that? You know, and what's that like? And he goes, well, it's like a black tree, 
black tar going into my lungs or into my body. So as soon as I heard that, I was like, okay, so that normally is trauma stuff, right? So I was like, so I was ready for that. So then what I did is I kept taking him back to, because I didn't want to say that's not the right thing to say or da, 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 anything like that. But I didn't want to start going deeper and deeper into the tar stuff because you only do that if you're going to do the trauma work, right? So then I said, okay, and um, and whereabouts, and you know, I brought it back into the general idea of thinking about where your artistic practice is or something like that. I think it was like, that's why he thought, that's where his artistic practice came from, right? But that wasn't what I could keep processing in that space because we were lying down on the gym floor with a hundred other people. It was a private conversation between me and him in a way, but you know, I'd not met him before. There was no contract between us, there's no nothing, right? So um, I, I respected it and I, it had gone relatively deep, but it wasn't, it wasn't any deeper than what he'd elicited it wasn't like but i didn't start taking it further and further and further into that space right so i brought it back into the metaphors around him rather than the stuff inside him it gets a bit more complex then, right? symbolic modeling then symbolic modeling is the process that's a bit more yeah they use that in the coaching work the the way they use it in organizations is then you can start but you're not really talking about that because you're talking about someone's listening to them so I'll, I'll try and find this lady who does the listening post because for whatever reason i can't find it and she's actually um because there's one i use one there's clean language for the classroom and i've done it with school kids i did it with primary school children and that's quite fun um and then they build a metaphor about what it's like for them to be at their best all the school kids to be at their best and that that's really fun because one of the things i say so what would it be like as a class if we were at our best? And we'd be like, we'd be like reading a book. And how big would the book be? And I had this book the size of the room. Ah, oh, she's and connected to that. I'm based in Birmingham, and uh, I've got a bit of a mixture of uh, employment. Really, I work full time for the NHS as a leadership trainer, and um, I also do some freelance work and some women's development work. Already, I'm seeing a massive difference. From day one, I was starting to use clean in um, in conversations generally, day to day. In training, I was teaching people to, to use the questions. Um, in a workshop that I had where um, somebody uh, was relating a very painful experience and was stuck, um, I was able to help that person get unstuck and, and into a much more positive place by using uh, clean questions. Um, I think the speed and the, uh, the elegance with which um, I was able to uh, facilitate her thinking differently uh, and being different um, was just amazing. And I'm sure that wouldn't have happened ordinarily. So that was a real gift to be able to give that person. It hasn't always worked um, seamlessly. Sometimes people have been a bit baffled by the questions, but I've tried a different approach and used the clean questions in a slightly different way and it's worked. Um, so uh, yeah, I think um, most people um, get it and love it and some people say all oh, this is a bit weird but they still do it and it works and a few people don't quite get it yet you know but in the main it's it's been transformational people don't get it and it's a bit weird um i just treat it as an opportunity to uh to come at it differently and i think well, i think that the great thing for me is i've been able to blend clean with everything else i do so normally by trying uh mixing things up a little bit and trying a new approach i can get to the same place but still involving using the clean and that's what i really like about it the fact that i've been able to involve cleaning in the, the stuff that i ordinarily do it's really lifted everything um and it's it's really worked fantastically well with these other approaches uh, i've been speaking to people based in france uh, germany um, america just all over the place and really made some um, deep, deep connections with people um and also got some uh, some real insights um around uh, cultural differences and different ways of thinking and seeing how uh, people are applying clean in their own environments and that was as, as powerful really as, uh, as the taught learning for me and the opportunity to, to practice with people outside of the group was a, a fantastic thing too uh, because you really form um, quite a deep bond within the group so very very early on um, I was able to use the learning uh, personally I did um, a clean language selfie when I was particularly stuck about something I actually posted that very early on online which is quite a brave thing to do but that was amazing 
uh, and it really transformed my own experience um, of something that I was feeling really worried and nervous about. Um, so yeah, I just think I've grown um, hugely as a result of it, and um, I think it's almost been like a, a kind of glue that's helped me to kind of pull things together uh, and and make those things more of my own um, and become much more emergent really in, in my approach. So it's been fantastic. So the kind of people that I think would find this uh, most useful would be um, everyone, um, facilitators, trainers, coaches, um, people who want to understand themselves a bit better, any kind of helping um, role, um, so uh, uh, counsellors, um, really it would help everyone, I think. Yeah, it's not her, but she's one of one of one of those people that dedicated her life to this. So, I just want to share this little bit of her of her experience around clean language. You're you're mute, Stefan. Oh yeah, that's a good that's a good video. Thanks for that. Yeah, I know her. She's part of the clean language community for sure, and she's uh, she's really nice actually, and and she's using it like I say in a maybe more. Well, you could hear it, right? She's using it in that kind of blended way. It's actually been used in the health service quite a lot in the UK. The, the UK is probably the main place it's being used at the moment. Um, but there's a bit going on in France, and some of that wouldn't necessarily know because they're doing it in French language. Um, but um, yeah, the, the, the opportunities in the, in the healthcare, because how can a doctor help to listen to their client, right? It's really hard for a doctor to... So um, they've got a whole thing about that and they use it a lot as well for i mean that's where it gets a bit more specialized but any every single way the only way you can describe pain is a metaphor so what they do is they try and so rather than the doctor saying telling the client the metaphor and seeing if that's right you get the client to model their own pain so rather than saying is it a stabbing pain is it a throbbing pain is it the da 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 you just say and when you have that pain whereabouts is that pain and what happens when that yeah, pain but I, is there? but I, I i want to to i think that we have a huge opportunity to explore here yeah related to two two dynamics that two topics and thematics that we have been exploring uh yeah. all all our time here was one of course related to wealth uh, how, how how do you, how do we relate clean language dynamics with wealth generation? Yeah. The another one related to the scaling dynamics that you brought to here to for us to explore together, uh, where clean language is, we, we, we can we can tackle with clean language in a in a in a in a not in a therapeutic way but in a in a conversational way in our daily lives, right? In the scaling up and scaling down dynamics that you uh, you, you always talk about, Stefan. So yeah. there's two things that I don't see out there people making relationship with. And uh, I think that would be nice for us to start to explore a little bit around this. How do you, for instance, make relationship uh, uh, between uh, I embedded clean language dynamics that is not using being used in, in, in as a, a organizational tool for startups using agile for instance or yeah. a therapeutic session with uh, with uh, uh, with uh, a psycho psychoanalyst so feel free yeah that's a good question I mean I mean generally one it can be used. This is this is. Um, I find it's really useful when I need to get it and really understand something deeper. And to get so you can have a normal conversation and and there seems to be something which seems ambiguous. Something you want to understand what that might be, and you you can sort of rather than assuming that we have a common understanding of that you can go deeper into that and ask them what's the, what what kind of is that what happens when um what's your intention what would you like you know um 
in in terms of wealth then we we start to get into the idea of what are resources you could say that wealth is basically future resources that you can access in a way and that and that's thinking about resources in the broadest sense right emotional resources social capital um environmental capital peace um so you know wealth has traditionally been thought of as um, being able to reliquidate money generally, but you know the the this idea of in a way you're talking about how do we store future value, how do we store future meaningfulness, um, and well, you know in theory that's what drives the art world to have such high value. But as we know, a lot of the value is basically because it's become another form of currency, right? There's not really a, a true if, if reason I, why um, some of these things are uh, Maybe I can relate to uh, some of that. Um, but I think uh, <clears throat> one uh, uh, immediate um, application <clears throat> um, is, rather than wealth, is value. Uh, since we spoke about pain and the doctors, you know, pain as being a subjective experience that it's kind of hard to represent uh, other than using metaphors. <clears throat> um, you know, when you think about value, um, um, you know, this, this, this one thing that uh, we are doing uh, within Sensorica and when we talk about uh, collaborative entrepreneurship, it's like value, we consider value as a subjective experience. And the role of a, a collaborative entrepreneur is to create an environment um, that provides value experiences. And a value experience is, 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 a, is, a, is, a, is a sort of a subjective experience that, that draws you into doing something. So it's related to action. Okay, so when you say, um, uh, what is the value of an ice cream? Well, it's, it depends how much that thing drives you towards it. Um, how much effort are you willing to, you know, uh, deploy? So are you just going to sit on the uh, couch and, uh, and complain that it's hot outside? Or are you going to get up, um, you know, go to the bank, pull up some money uh, and, uh, and go buy yourself an ice cream or a, or a cold drink, right? Um, so, so when you create a collaborative, uh, uh, and, and endeavor, you know, um, people are drawing for participation for different reasons. Okay. So somebody says, oh, it's a nice place to learn. Okay. Another guy says, oh, um, it's a nice uh, place where I can, I can prove my, or, or test my knowledge or skills or, or is a place where I can make some friends, or it's a place uh, where I can make some money. Okay, so the problem with capitalism is that uh, value is money, right? So they just project everything to one dimension. Um, and therefore, you know, in order to incentivize people to participate, you know, um, you know, you you give them money, you offer them money, and you threaten them to pull the money away, <laughs> you know, and you create a system around them where money is necessary. Okay, so there's no other way around, right? So that's basically how capitalism works uh, in relation to value, you know, which is a basic concept of an in, in, within an economy. You create an environment or where you make something, um, you, you collapse everything into something, so you make that thing a necessity, okay? So if you want to access anything in life, education, shelter, food, you got to have money. And now it's now it becomes easy. Okay, because because you can use money to incentivize people to work. <laughs> so, but in a collaborative environment, you know, it's very different. So, so now here's the question. Um, that was the introduction. So here's the question: A collaborative entrepreneur has to sit down and say, "Well, I need at least twenty people that have different skills and probably different motivations and look at life in a different way. I need twenty people to gather around this uh, endeavor." Okay, so what can I put on the table and how can I communicate that? First of all, you need to know what they, because it's it's a case by case, right? Um, so so that would help that would help the collaborative entrepreneur, the instigator, maybe to um, 
to probe around and see what 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 people would resonate with. So when you see when you the doctor asks like how how does your fe pain feel like, the collaborative entrepreneur would ask questions to to kind of understand why people are there for. You know who's there for education? Who's there for maybe some people are there for things that I never ever dreamt about. You know, maybe it's a spiritual quest for somebody. You know, so it's like, what is value like for you? You know what I'm saying? That kind of thing. That kind of thing. I, I wonder if it's. I never. I never used it. Um. The the way I usually uh, practice this in the past was to talk about the was to dress up the venture with some purpose and and then have people process that internally and come to it for their for various reasons and then sense these reasons and try to accommodate them so whenever a new whenever a new guy pops into the project i kind of try to understand what is the main driver uh, what is the value experience that this person looks uh, for? And if I sense that that person is kind of lonely and needs some connections, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to facilitate that and try to find some nice people in the group that could team up with this guy as buddies. You know what I'm saying? Um, <clears throat> so you see what I'm getting at? Yeah, I, I do. I get, I get some of that. Um, and... I think one thing this also raises the interesting thing is is where you've got experience that's valuable and there's also valuable artifacts that we ascribe like ultimately there's what what is what has value to me and what I can communicate as having value to more people. So for instance, I can have a, a valuable experience going down to the lake, right? But there's this experience that I attended the, 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 the marriage of Charles and Diana, and I was there and I had this experience, right? So, you know, so that's more broadly, a, there's something seen in that. But the, the, that has happened like this is the challenge you always have with um performative stuff is performance is only happening when it happens right you walk in the theater when there's no one on stage there's no one on stage it's, it's, it's only when the actual thing happens and then you find that it becomes the program it becomes the costumes it becomes the photographs it becomes the signatures it becomes the memorabilia of of that is what then is moved forward um so you've got this you do have this tension between materiality like it's the gold coin you know that has value and um yes Stefan, let, let me help you there by by sharing this uh uh talking about real modes real mode language coming from David Baum. Mm -hmm. That is something for me more disruptive than being language, far more disruptive. Mm -hmm. And I just want to read this piece here. There has been a strand of process based philosophical thinking, including Hegel, Marx, Engel, Whitehead, and more recently cybernetics influenced thinkers such as Gregory Bateson and Eva Thompson, which describes a dynamic systems materialism. As the neurophenomenologist even Thompson so clearly describes in such model, uh, open quotes, everything is process all the way down and all the way up, and processes are irreducibly relational. They exist only in patterns, networks, organizations, configurations, or webs. In the process view, up and down are context relative terms used to describe phenomena of various scales and complexity. There is no base level of elementary entities to serve as the ultimate emergent base on which to ground everything. Phenomena at all scales are not entities, but relatively stable processes. And since processes achieve stability at different levels of complexity, while still interacting with processes, 
at other levels, all are equally real and none has absolutely absolute ontological ontological primacy. Close quote. Even even Thompson, mind and life, biology, phenology, and science of minds. Okay, this is from 2007. I, I didn't read this book, but I read mm -hmm. ex experts some some time ago and has it indexed here in my search engine. And I remember this. So I think that this is the basis of what we're talking here about in the basis of generation of meaning, TB. So, as so, meaning and value. So, so uh, we, we and, and, and when David Bohm proposed the real mode, uh, uh, real mode language as experience to to perceive language as movement and not as as material objects. He was saying this here, basically. Uh, these thinkers have argued that the attempts to think in terms of processes of becoming, rather than solely in terms of objects and being, as we tend to do is not just an important task for personal, political, and ecological reasons. It is also a more realistic metaphysical basis for grasping the nature of reality. The dialectical quantum physicist David Bohm, who stated that reality is, open quote, more like quantum organism than quantum mechanics, close quote, has suggested that, open quote, the notion of a permanent object with well-defined properties can no longer be taken as a basics in physics. Rather, it is necessary to begin with the event as a basic, as a basic concept and later to arrive at the object as a continuing structure of related and ordered events. This is very interesting, right? This is a quote from David Bohm itself in Problems in the Basic Concepts of Physics, an inaugural lecture delivered by Birkbeck College in 1963. So he was already talking about this in 1963, right? Mm -hmm. Bohm argued that our language was far too object-oriented or non-based, and argued that this was making us see a world of static objects instead of dynamic processes. In wholeness, and the implicate order, Bohm asks the reader to consider what is implied in the statement, open quotes, is it raining, close quotes? He asks, open quotes, where is the if that would, according to the sentence, be, open quotes, the rainer that is doing the raining, close quotes. Bohm concludes that that's op open quotes clearly, it would be more accurate to say that, open quote, rain is going on, close quote, right? And, and we see that in Aboriginal indigenous languages, cultures, they, they, their language is, is in the, always in the move, is always, uh, is always part of the creation of life itself. So I just want to, to, to toss this in our conversation here. Mm. Mm -hmm. that's good i did that's really good i mean you could say the free energy principle adds now that's why they talk about the free energy principle as being um a unifying principle rather than a unified theory and that's that and just back to the same thing the unifying principle is a principle which is implicitly present in these processes the process of free energy minimization being part of that or so you get this is it's not a thing you can't disprove it basically um it's what appears to happen where things are more yeah, the free energy principle is the more you reduce free energy, the more like life things are. Um, yeah, uh, guys, I, I didn't want to. No, that's to, a really good. 
I didn't know David Bowman. I've been hearing about David Bowman. I think he was, yeah, I think this both, all of those would be, I mean, what's happened since that time now is the free energy principle and active inference is, um, and Evan Thompson, he's kind of embraced active inference. He's in the active inference thing now. He's a bit more pushing the inactivist mode, but I think even he's sort of letting that go a bit. Um, Yeah, I totally well, problem, agree. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, I agree with moving away from uh, from objects um, to some degree, you know. <clears throat> um, and um, yeah, and even Karl Marx, when he criticized capitalism, he spoke about the fetishism of money, you know, money becoming an object and people wanting that object just for itself mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> instead of seeing money as a medium, right, of exchange um, <clears throat> as part of of a process um and value is the same thing um value is uh, spoken about in 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 uh, in books in the, of economics as 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 a substance as something that you can store something that you can transfer to somebody else something that uh, um um what is it a store of value a means of uh, <clears throat> exchange um something that you can create Okay, for you and for others, <laughs> you know, value creation, right? Um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so that's lang that language is completely wrong. You know, it's value is not a thing, right? So that's why we say it's a, it's an experience. Um, it's not a well, experience is a process in some sense, but um, <clears throat> that that if you if you consider value as a as an experience and not as an object or as a substance that you can create, destroy. Uh, store and, and and give to someone <clears throat> if it's if it's an experience then um, and then all the talk about about value uh, about the economy it's not about things okay all the talk about the economy becomes just about what drives people and not about things because today we may like uh, something and for cultural reasons, and 100 years later, we despise that thing, or we think it's not good. We think it should, you know, it's like burning coal, for example. Okay, um, nobody would burn coal to to heat up their houses today because I don't know because it's 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 associated with pollution. So you see, all that change has been in people's mind uh, and the way they perceive things, <clears throat> and all the marketing bullshit. You know, it's uh, it's based on that. Okay, so you don't sell the object. You, you just sell. You just sell. You just sell the experience. You just sell what people, uh, <clears throat> how people should feel like um, when they're in contact with this, with this, with this object. So it's based on the, it's based on that idea that value is not a substance um, <clears throat> and it is an experience, and that that's how things are sold. Um, you know, but it took some psychologists to do <laughs> actually Ber uh, Edward Ber Bernays or what's his name, <laughs> you know, to 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 bring psychology into that. Um, yeah, I mean, that's also the, the, that's advertise the difference between marketing and advertising as well, right? So advertising is particularly about bringing out the value, um, in terms of how it emotes stuff and marketing is, is more substantial in some ways. It's more transactional. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, um, whereas advertising is more conceptual the only thing i would say is when we say that something becomes it i would say this is what i'm in taking an infusion perspective is every time money becomes the thing that we admire then we need we have another e experiential ecosystem another way of embodiment in which that ecosystem is working with money in the niche and that money in the niche be it as a fetishized object now becomes what's being played with so what you get is you get this jump between we've got multiple ways of embodying these types of um and some places it actually like i don't know if you ever been to the city of london it's like the square mile i mean it is just less so now because I, I went up there when my friends were like school before Canary Wolf got so big, 
you know that that it was just all banks right i mean it's all is the financial district right yeah. and um in there the the mode of value is how to move money around because that's the teleology right but that becomes its own landscape it becomes there's a landscape a meta landscape of money which people can inhabit but generally speaking the general person in the, in the daily life around the country doesn't live in that world they just live in the world of money being part of their transactions right um and if you work as a plumber or whatever you work as a plumber but of course what's happened a lot with capitalism is they've then tried to bring in the petty bourgeoisie so that they kind of have a, a stake in this other landscape which is a kind of you know but each of these can be seen in an embodied way and each of these can be seen in its own performative way um so it all depends on where you are at the time you know just like you change your values when you're halfway through a soccer game and you're trying to score a goal i mean the value there is get the ball in the net and maintain some sportsmanship and everything off the pitch dissolves away i mean that's one of the benefits of sport it allows you to dissolve away these other um these other value propositions that constrain our behavior um so i don't know how you take that tibby but you know how could you imagine this idea of bringing values into different kinds of experiential ecosystems be it based i mean that would be kind of the to bring it over into a kind of um an infusion kind of way is really getting into where where are you orientated in the world in relation to that because um you know you want to build a bridge in theory you could sell 10 gold medallions at auction to raise some of the money to build a bridge to get to the other side of a, 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 a you know an industrial area so the selling of the medallions people in the sell when you you sell the medallions those people are just buying them in a completely different experiential ecosystem of which what the money that that generates will then give you know they they basically they're just seeing that as a as a locked up form of wealth um in there and part of the value will be that that it is a it's a representative value right and part of the value may be in the fact that it's going to maintain that value and that's one thing that experiences can't do in the moment you know the value of a concert with the rolling stones can't be maintained beyond the concert of the rolling stones because it's happened right whereas the gold coins theoretically can carry on but there has to be some chain of experiential ecosystems that all add up to make that make sense um no but it, it, it can because um the experience of value um it's not necessarily in the moment okay um and and that's that's the that's that's a very important thing uh it's always a projection in the future and uh, and 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 a representation of what that future will be uh, <clears throat> because if I'm if I'm hot, you know, I can say, oh, it would be nice to have an ice cream. Um, and then what moves me towards it is that is that I know there is ice cream somewhere and I will be able to get it. And I can imagine that experience. I see myself eating that ice cream and 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 being refreshed. <clears throat> um, no. Um, it's everything is like that in economy, right? When we talk about the value experience, it's always a projection in the future because you make the decision now to acquire something that you will enjoy in the future. <clears throat> Not no, I wouldn't. I would disagree on that actually because I think there's two things. When I worked, I worked at this auction house, so it's quite interesting. They were selling all these paintings and stuff like that. Their paintings, they're like, you know, half a million pound paintings. And stuff. You've got yeah. two things that they're after. Like you've got someone that you could have someone. You come in. This painting came in, da 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 da, and um, two people really want that painting, right? This is one scenario. Two people really want that painting, and they've got lots of money. And everyone in the world, if you said to them, "What do you think of those two paintings?" Everyone in the whole world says, ah, "I'll give you, I'll give you a hundred dollars." But those two people have both got money, and they're both prepared to pay half a million. 
they may pay half a million, right? And they know that when they die or whatever, it's worth $100. This is a very extreme example, right? So it's driven purely by when this painting, if they get that painting, they see value in that painting in that wall, the huge, unbelievable benefit, the experience, it's so massive that they will pay half a million, right? And they know that if they die, they don't care that it'd be worth 100. The other scenario is someone comes in, they don't care what that painting is. All they care about is the provenance and the potential that that thing will go up in the future or hold its value in a market, just well, that, like that's, it is that, with the stock that's market. Exactly, that's, exactly, that's exactly it. So what you're saying is that everybody lives this experience in a different way. No, that's but, no, no, I'm saying but, the opposite but, but, of that. No, no, I'm not, because I'm saying the exact opposite. I'm saying that there's two completely different ways of even going about having the experience. Like one is I've got a pragmatic thing where my eco environmental ecological ecosystem is purely how do I manage um, this as a trading system, right? Yep. There's mm -hmm. no experiential benefit to me. It's just it might as well be um, a can of dog food. But if it was a million dollar can of dog food, I'll buy it as long as I knew it was going to hold its value. And then the other person is, I want it. No, but wait, no. wait, wait. It, it, does, it doesn't mean that there is no experiential value because now what you're projecting in the future is that you're going to get some money that will allow you to go in vacation and leave that, um, you know, um, a dream vacation with, uh, with your honey. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, um, not necessarily <clears throat> because, no, no, I've got enough money to, no, I've got enough money to do all my vacations and everything else. And I earned this year 10 times more money than that. And this is just one transaction of which I wasn't even going to do it, but I, I, it came up on my computer system and I decided to get my assistant to just process it quickly while I'm... Then, then it's a game, but it's also an experience. Why do people play games? Why it do is, people it is a game, but it's society? completely it's different. But it's not... A, it's not it's, it, is, it has a value in the sense that the person's working, but they, again, they're not working in that moment as opposed to someone who's buying the thing because uh, in that instance, that is something that they really, really want for them, right? Because the other person's not even gonna have that painting, right? They're buying it, they're not even gonna have it, they're not gonna see it. They may not even go to the auction. They could be ringing in for the auction, right? It could just be part, part of a portfolio that they're gonna use as a hedge fund to, to um to to go against losses that they're going to put on a starbucks cafe that they're going to buy i mean it really could be completely but what's so what i'm saying there's a there's a complete instrumentalized um process just like the stock market right where yeah there's an experiential ecosystem of just playing the game in this metaverse it's like a metaverse really and um oh we've got a bit of noise kicking in um that might be yours to be just be careful if you might um and um, so that's why in the infusion space, I've got the stuff which is my daily life, the stuff which is my organizational space around a teleology, which I constrain and has a value creation in terms of making experiences for others or making things happen. But then we have this regulatory system to manage value, which is, is actually, well, the stock market, it becomes its own gain. It's like the idea is that we can't manage it here, so we'll let them do it. The trouble is the game is being gamed. <laughs> it's not a bad game in a way, but the trouble with capitalism, and I think is if it was done honestly, and it's never been done honestly because it always gets rigged, right? And you, you find that so many people can now siphon off the value propositions out of the system. So basically people's the value that people have in that system is to be in their game, to play the game of selling shares or selling, selling artifacts from art shows or auctions. But it doesn't negate the fact that there will, so that's what I'm saying is, yeah, they, they get value out of that. Just like, obviously they get money, they can do stuff with the money, but to some extent, you know, the it's like William Warren Buffett doesn't, I mean, he's got what? How many billion? Like, and yet he still has an old phone in his pocket. He doesn't need the money for anything else apart from the fact that that's the game he does, right? But 
so how so what i'm saying is it's experiential ecosystems all the way up and down even the ones which are kind of capitalist um and a lot of that comes down to the, maybe actually making the sale and showing how much money you've made becomes the experience like the experience is how much profit you made like your people's wealth becomes the experience of status in certain social classes you know and that in itself becomes a challenge because it's it's completely devoid of whether they need to get ice cream or something um there's this it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's not it doesn't go up the, the line doesn't just go up in a straight line it, it there's this vast jump between the upper class and the and the sort of super upper class you know um the middle class to the upper class and the and the elites that's, that's jumps what it is massively that's what it is when you when you when you um think about value as an experience <clears throat> It just depends on every individual, um, their context, their culture, um, their social class, whatever. It's it's an experience, it's an experience. It's a subjective experience, okay? But it's not any subjective experience. It's one that drives you into action, <clears throat> okay? And and this is a very, um, this is a very um, a useful. Um, um, definition of value in collaborative projects, okay? Without this, you cannot run a project because you always have to ask yourself the question, um, why are these people here? What drove them to, you know, what makes this guy on a Saturday morning, instead of sleeping and watching, a, I don't know, a video, what makes this guy come to the lab to work on this project with us? Okay, because it's not about money, that's for sure. <laughs> you know, we're not a company. Okay, it's not about money. So so you see that it's a very important question. <clears throat> and yeah, you see the rich guy and you see the poor guy and you see the student and you see people for all walks of life and all religions <clears throat> um, that come there. <clears throat> but we all, we, you know, so so we, we all go through this value experience, <clears throat> you know, because because there is something in us that moves us towards that, <clears throat> but it's all different for everyone, <clears throat> you know. <clears throat> so it's very important to kind of understand the makeup of that group in terms of <clears throat> what do people experience, um, you know, in that moment. What is their their value experience? That's how I talk about things. What is their value experience? It may have nothing to do with the project. <clears throat> it's just being there at the lab with people. Who cares? That's their experience. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? <clears throat> yeah, Stefan, Stefan, before you, you comment on what yeah, you yeah. just shared, I would just want to add a little bit of craziness, <laughs> of metaphysical craziness to what we're talking here about. Yeah, I agree totally, TB. Uh, but we, we are imaginative beings, right? So we are, in this sense, we project... Uh, once light hits our eyes and goes for our brain, we we what we see uh, what we see as reality. There's the crude reality of just seeing what we're seeing through light, right? The spectrum of light through our brains. But we also do this thing to uh, imagine uh, what could be out there. Imagine what could become reality, right? for us, what could become reality as imaginary beings. But we're not only imaginary beings, we are social beings in the sense that in order for this reality to gain reality, we need to generate, uh, uh, we need to signal it, right? We need to signal what we want to uh, co create or co-create as reality. And, and, and in the signaling, in, in doing the signaling, we are, are signaling. We are, we are signaling uh, what, 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 what is is driving us. What is driving you, right? You or uh, or a community or a tribe. But what is driving uh, the the creation, the the, the co-creation, the creation of that type of 
that type of reality that actually doesn't exist in the broader reality, right? So in this sense, the creation of value is a network of dynamics and, uh, and, and, and crucially depends, you have, to, you have to step in your two foot, right? You have to step in your, your two foot. You have to step on actual existing realities in order to create another, right? So it doesn't come from the not nothingness. It comes from a place that all, it, it, it's already depends it already depends of existing realities and its existing values. So it's a type of a, a, a egg and a chicken question, right? Uh, in, in a sense that uh, it's uh, for us as social and aggregated and networked beings, uh, it doesn't even even that subjectivity that comes from a, a unique peer, a unique person is based upon something that is based upon something that he he or she already values right as a reality already values as experience so it's not devoid it's not totally separate it's so in this sense uh, any any creation of meaning is a co-creation what I'm, I'm trying to say is any creation of meaning is a co-creation is because it's already comes out embedded by other other uh, other generators of meaning and value right it, it can be subject the subjectivity depends on this even your notion of of subjective notion of of what is has value for you or not depends on the already existing frameworks or already existing superstructures that I, I like to put it uh, to, to generate meaning and to generate value. So I just want to put that in our, in our conversation here. Yeah, I think that's a very, that's a really good point. Like this, uh, when you said it's, I don't know if you said it was on someone on top, but you could say that if something's seen as having value, or, or having value to me, I would, it would say it's a more, it's something that can be discerned objectively from an observer almost looking down on the situation. You know, I can look down with a meta perspective and I can see clearly that, oh, well, I can see the value here and I can see the value here and I can see the value there. But what might be meaningful tends to maybe come more from an organic un invisible within and there's a meeting of the two so the, the value proposition is more what's available um, and, 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 and it's visible externally because it's shown to drive behavior right I'm seeing how this value seems to be driving behavior but what might be meaningful might not be visible even to the person in their yeah own yeah yeah and, and, yeah yeah I agree with you and I just just to just no 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 I just I want you to continue because you're 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 exploring in in, in a very interesting way what I just my, my my commentary what I just want to add to this for this uh, for what we're talking here about what we're exploring is uh, language we start we start today talking about clean language and then i talked about real mode and uh, how real mode is more disruptive because it puts you in a meta position to critically understand what what is the, the underlying basis of all the things that has meaning for you and it, 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 it influences your behavior right in the real mode dynamics and and you can feel the movement of the language within you and in between the others, right? Like indigenous and Aboriginal people does because they have a, a type of language that is is impaired, is symbiot symbiotically impaired with nature, with the movement of nature, with the stations and things like that. And the clean language is just a way for us to be in a neutral zone 
where you can you can you can zoom out or zoom in uh, within the language that you you know you are captured by. It's all making mach making meaning machines, right? To generate values. So that's that. So in, in that way. of that and in this in that sense the the type of complex collapses that we're living is really and the meaning crisis that is out there and the meta crisis whatever uh, is really putting us to, in this place to perceive our complexity and, and and the challenge within our complexity to perceive how we we can dealt uh, we, we, we can dealt without fear. We can dealt without, uh, 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 you know, uh, without uh, a proper grounding, a proper grounding for your two foot, to, for you for you to scan your with your two feet, right? Uh, in order for us to uh, uh, understand how, how crazy <laughs> is our existence. Right? How how uh, how crazy and, and and how much we don't know about ourselves and our our surrounding what we call realities. Right? So I, I, I'll end up here and and pass to you, Stefan. Again. <clears throat> and so so what 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 one thing that clean language does then is it gives a way within language to try and find that meaning within the structure of what we know. A couple of the key questions that it does ask within all of that, which is quite interesting, is whereabouts, where did that come from? The sort of questions, that, that's the ones that are like unusual questions. What size and shape does that have, right? What? So you talk about money, this money here, that was really important. Oh, okay. What size and shape would that value have? And what's the difference between the value of that What's the size and shape of that value? And what's similar difference to the size and shape of this value? And, and then whereabouts are we? And where did they come from? And even that you can only go so far because you're still trapped in language, which is why they ended up generating clean space and this whole clean space work, because then you freed out of even language. Um, but there is, there is a sense of value really is expressed in terms of what is valuable. Right. So and you and we have this thing because I mean, this is where we're talking about wealth, like the whole thing is we are trying to navigate how do we manage codification at some point so that we can work with that because and codification is basically what is that just like you have a child. Why is that? What's that? What's that? What's that? We want to know what it is. Right. And it's and the assumption is that's what we need to be able to do all the time. And of course, that is often what we need to do. And it is useful, and it's very valuable, but it's not telling us where the meaning is. And one of the key things with indigenous knowledge is it's a land based knowledge. It's not a place based knowledge, it's not a space based knowledge, it's not a word, but it's a land based knowledge. So it matters, which is why indigenous knowledge in the Amazon will be different to the Arctic, and it will be different to Australia because the land is different right and um even what and it will have evolved differently because of that so and of course it's tied to nature because nature there is that land you know <laughs> so you're not going to find an anaconda in the middle of australia right in the desert it's never going to be there right and you're not going to find a scorpion in the middle of the well not the same type anyway in the middle of the amazon right so or in the arctic so this is where it gets kind of interesting is is how do we move between ways of knowing and where can the codifications like you know be brought back down from this kind of thing over there and noticing that that thing over there is only a thing over there because i'm observing it from here it's not inherently over there and that's one of the problems probably with capitalism is capitalism is not over there for people who work in the city of London or Wall Street. For them, 
this is the world and farming is over there because they're sitting in the middle of well what would have been the world trade center or whatever they're in you know um and those things over there become externalized things um and that's um but the yeah yeah that's a that that's a beautiful way to talk about externalities in capitalism right <laughs> like mm -hmm. a a, a, a beautiful way in the sense that a very lucid way to talk about the, the externalities that are not in the equation of all the things that we consume, right? All, all, the, all the products that we produce. Because these externalities are out there. <laughs> it's not part of them. So, yeah, in that sense, we, we explore the planet and all resources, but it's out there. It's not part of my meaning making machine reality yeah yeah very yeah. very well put for those people anyway yeah and, and that, so that's where you get into this multi like somehow we have to well the other way is to make an alternative which can compete with their reality so that people can come into another world i suppose but um yeah but but there, there's when it comes to blockchain web3 even bitcoin there's a discourse and a practice out there talking about new sorts of decentralized coordination uh, and, and, and to generate new patterns, new ways, new me meaning making machines for new types of, for a decentralized, culturally decentralized reality where, you know, it, 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 less dependable of the actual ones that we depend upon. So, that is out there, not exactly the way that I said, but that where I see, uh, 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 see, Stefan and TB and, and Laurie, I see a, a real opportunity with what we're doing with re -re regenerative resources, because cybernetically speaking, there's an opportunity to culturally, culturally create decentralized patterns, decentralized ways to, uh, to, new meaning making machines related to abundance logic in a peer-to-peer -peer way in a very interactive peer-to-peer -peer way so that's the huge opportunity that i really see in vision within this uh, work that we've been doing for almost two years now and and that gained traction through here our conversations actually it, it, it was born here in our rwi touchdowns so, so uh, just so coming uh, uh, coming back to our conversation, it, it's very interesting how, and we are having this opportunity in a planetary scale, Stefan. We 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 maybe in the past may may have done this uh, in, in different times, but not in a planetary scale like we are actually doing now, right? And uh, yeah, I just want to add that. Mm. When you say planetary scale, I, I hear what you're saying, not in a... There's something about it that's scaling up. Yeah, but, but it's not in a... When I say planetary scale, I don't, I'm not referring to the globalization, for instance. Mm -hmm. I'm, not re uh, I'm not referring to uh, the way that nation states and corporations uh, systematize their their coordination mechanisms within them in, in supply chains, for instance, for this hyper-consumerist microeconomy that we have. Yeah. Uh, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, um, all this speculation, the financial speculation uh, mm -hmm. that uh, that captures the value of production, for instance, in, in, the, in, 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 the, in, the, in the markets. Uh, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the global paradigm in the sense mm -hmm. that Mike Michel Baldwin talks about the cosmolocal, right? The transnational, mm -hmm. or the way that TV puts it, the transnational thing. So when we are starting to integrate the hyperlocal where I am now with the bioregional that I don't, that exist, but I, I'm not related to, to the planetary scale. So I'm talking about a, a dynamics that is at the same time is, uh, is 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 net to, is net to weaving these dimensions of reality within people uh, within bioregions 
within you know cultures and within languages so i'm talking about that yeah yeah could you could you even say multi watershed scale like yes. it's like you know it's almost like it has the potential to go because the global potential is always to some extent physical as well right and it could get harder globally as some parts of the world become less hospitable right outside because global warming is going to but there's a, like a multi multi water like there's a there's a there's a level of basically what the banks were able to do with their networks of financial exchange you're able to have it another level because they were being they were being connected up purely at this um value representation scale but theoretically if you can get it tied to bioregions in a meaningful way then it could be like is it more important to have four meaningful relationships between four key watersheds because i i went to a talk on the eco psychology group to this week actually it was a very good one about the great lakes 10 percent of all the 20 percent of all the world's fresh water actually lake superior alone has 10 percent of all the world's fresh water right that whole ecosystem has been heavily polluted over the years but it's but that they're doing a lot of things they were talking what can we learn from watershed management right and there may be some really interesting relationships here because that's the challenge that the ecosystem based in financial institutions cannot easily match that value with bios biosystem value except by you know, there's this fudge with carbon credits and they're trying right but i don't know i don't see any way they can get around that problem right i think that, that this is the thing somehow you have to bring in values or value that's at the scale and at the the context of the bioregions or the socio bioregions and that has to be within the same transaction structure what they're trying to do is you have the negotiations you do the money exchange and you try and build all that stuff in later or before and there's a there's a whole sort of fudge to try and build in this value but you can't build it into the transaction because the transaction doesn't have that option so if this but I don't think the word planet or global does it because I still think that that's in the in the realm of what they can do with abstract meta capitalism. There's something actually it's almost it's 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 um, multi local, if that makes sense, which isn't quite the same as global. Now, I know it's a pain because global is a nice word, right? But um, and it's but I do think there's something different because and this game is coming back to the work of Bruno Latour and his work with the groundling grounding. There's something where we have a crisis of modernism and progressivism, which is towards globalization. And we've we've now got a crisis because that doesn't work. And all that's happened is people are regressing back to nationalism. But we need to go to somewhere to the side, which is basically grounding this multi bio regional work and the problem is that there's a scale problem to that in the current paradigm it's not even close right and you can greenwash it and they will greenwash it and there's loads of that going on and there'll be money to be made for people to do that so there's going to get people getting jobs in it and this is the problem right you're going to get people, because people will find a job wherever they can find a job and they're going to be very well paid people from very good universities so they're going to be extremely intelligent people doing that because they want to get the best jobs, but we have to find a way to, um, and, and, and that's also where I came up in one of the posts is, you know, is it a network? Is it a group of fields? I, I like the term. I like the idea of watersheds and bioregions or multi watershed or because, um, that is real. It is tangible, but it, and it, it and we are shaped by it. But it's not us that we can't kid ourselves. You can't change the Amazon basin, right? It is what it is, right? And the the Andes goes there, and it's very different to go on top of the Andes, and it's very different to go over to um, 
Bolivia into into Peru and down into Chile, right? Um, so you you are yeah yes, in... not 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 us not us as a species because we only exist to, uh, we I we suppose uh, two hundred and fifty thousand years or three hundred thousand years yeah. we're in this planet, yeah. but in a, a geological time scale, everything changes, right? Yeah. Uh, in the, in the indigenous in the Aboriginal indigenous people, uh, they think in, in terms of generations, of seven generations ahead, because yeah. they know that the scaling of of the change in in the geological uh, uh, scale is 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 something that we only can grasp in a metaphysical and imaginary way uh, of of meaning making. You can't do that, you know, a hundred years of your life or eight. Eight, 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 eight years of your life is, is nothing <laughs> in the geological scale of the planets, right? Yeah. Uh, in the yeah. time geological scale of the planet. So, uh, and, and this is something that is already happening too. When you talk about bioregions and watersheds, there's a whole movement out there and it's having a relationship with Web3 even um, to, to create new, new uh, wealth generators uh, Meaning making machines for new wealth generators related to Web3 using blockchain, for instance. So these things are happening, man. This is not, you know, this is not spe pure speculation. This is, oh, yeah. It's actually happening, right? And, uh, and it, it's happening at the same time of all the craziness that is happening around yeah. us and all the reactionists, like uh, uh, going back to nation state and things like that. So that's us. We are complex beings, right? So uh, we're not straightforward one thing. We're a lot of things at the same time. So that's the way that we are co-evoluting. Co-evolution, as, as Lima Gullis put in, in the 70s and the 80s, last century, is a very dirt, non-linear, and not, it, it does nothing have to... Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with progress. <laughs> like uh, progress is a very uh, captured word by technology and science, right? right? And uh, it's, a, it's a very dirt, non-linear and, and uh, uh, dynamics that doesn't depend of only your wish, right? Uh, because it's all intertwined. Uh, everything, life is intertwined. So we intertwined with life of this planet. We, of course, we could talk uh, differently if we were already a space a species, right? <laughs> because we wouldn't be intertwined with other forms of life uh, unless the, the aliens show oh, up. Yeah. <laughs> you will be though, you always will be because half the cells in our body are bacteria. No, 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 no. yes, of course, of course, of course, yeah, because yeah. we are the mix of the, everything. I, I, I got you. Yeah, yeah, totally. yeah, yeah. yeah. There's yeah, the bacteria sorry. and yes, yes. But we are- But I'm saying that we were out there uh, with our other beings within us, <laughs> right? Okay, yeah. If we if we manage, yeah, if we did pull that off, then yeah, exactly. That would be, uh, and that could be many. Well, let's say Toronto here, ten thousand to twenty thousand years ago, there was seven hundred feet of ice above Toronto. That's how come the Great Lakes got cut dug out. It's not that well, Gila, but you're right. The indigenous people they see those different generations. They see that, and um, but even within that, we are. You know, there's still a good chance that a lot of the river valleys would still be around. And I think this is this maybe is the, the challenge that we're trying to work out is how to move from these groundings into practical applications at different scales. And maybe there needs to be a multi scale version of blockchain. I mean, is there that possibility that you can you can work with blockchain and then it needs to it can be grounded in different ways like what sort of values could possibly be stored or communicated or aggregated in the sort of stuff lauren's talking about you know at what point you know sometimes there maybe there's it might be hypothetical but you know where is there a way to accumulate that and the what i am seeing as being this is something that i was trying to talk with um Tim about is how much can, in a way, the area of monitoring, if you look at monitoring, evaluation and learning, 
this process that will ultimately inform decision making and value appraisal, you could say, um, how much is the benefit of blockchain, the value appraisal piece? And where is the monitoring, evaluation and learning piece, which um, you know, and is there is there ways to have that more nuanced piece tracked? Um, I don't know. Maybe that's you know, there's different kinds of currency. Do they all have to be at the level of value, or is this? I, I mean, abstractly, it's value, but is there something more deflated than value? Yeah, it's, it's important to say that um, when it comes to the, the Web3 uh, uh, layer uh, that is being co-created, it's still very attached to this the crypto paradigm of tokenomics of crypto paradigms, right? But there's actually coming out of uh, 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 regenerative finance, for instance, refi. Mm -hmm. they're, they're they're creating protocols that aren't related to to this more conventional tokenomics of crypto, right? They they want to track, want to to validate and to recognize your track records and invest in your energy to co-create, for instance, a public good, something for the commons. Mm -hmm. So this this is happening already. So you have a, a, a whole. A, 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 uh, 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 layer two uh, in in the in the Ethereum public blockchain, you have a layer two. You have the layer one that's the main net of block of Ethereum blockchain, and you have the layer twos, right, mm -hmm. where you can transact uh, without paying uh, high gas fees and, and and with more velocities. But you have a dedicated layer two, Stefan, called Optimism, that wants to is incentivizing people to create all sorts of public goods, to generate decentralized coordination between different bioregions. Mm. So dedicated to that, to generate public goods. Uh, you see, uh, uh, public goods that are going to be coordinated for from from everybody, anyone in the planet. So anyone that knows about it, of course, mm. can be coordinated uh, in a in a in a in a, in a decentralized distributed way for that. So this is a novelty. This is something very interesting, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and they can cap they capture what is the 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 the, the, the economic engineering that they're doing that they capture they can capture they, they attract the value that um, the decentralized finance is generating, right? Through yields to their uh, their layer two, uh, because they offer a very uh, secure way to make transactions within Ethereum, right? A very secure and rapid way to do that. So, so they are extremely capitalized uh, with uh, with stable coins, for instance, for USDC. They are extremely capitalized in the sense that even their own token that is OP, you know, uh, uh, that they maybe is a utility token basically for governance and utility within the layer two, uh, is extremely valued. It, it, it has almost twenty dollars, and they don't speculate with with it. They don't put it in. in, in uh, they don't put it as a asset. Let's put it a crypto crypto asset to to speculate with. They just use it as a utility, for utility or for governance, within the, they call the collective of optimism. So that's very interesting, right? Mm. So they have loads of millions, dozens of millions or hundreds of millions of USDC or USDT that they are just <laughs> putting that via grants out there for people to want to generate these public goods. So 
this is not only crypto, right? This is not only uh, speculative uh, centralized finance, but they, as they offer a good solution for DeFi in the blockchain space, economic space, right? They become capitalized. So, and 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 they and their their actual mission state is that they want to incentivize the co-creation of all sorts of public goods, centralized coordination within uh, uh, using the centralized coordination to, you know, to do its governance in a planetary scale. So that's what I'm, I'm trying to say. Mm. This, this is, is one example. This is good though. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's one example. There's a bunch of others. Many. I'm just yeah. giving you one. And is, is there a way to, like, in some ways, going back to sort of Lauren's piece about the, the listening post and the stuff around, like, is there a sense that having places to translate back some of this, you know, because ultimately the, the whole of the finance system, you know, you have the LIBOR board and the, there's someone that tracks things back into place, right? They've got the LIBOR in the UK and got, like, is there places there, okay, how do we calibrate local transactions amongst non um what you could say locally calibrated you know what would be these this this layer two is there's is there a sense that we need to have spaces where you could come in and convene a a, a window of um calibration around value exchange at some of these other levels of optimism or meaningfulness i mean it could be even interesting to bring that into the active inference world where it's it's looking at the kind of different types of knowing you know um i don't know let's let's hold on to that i think we might let that one sit on our on our collective juices but um i think it's kind of interesting thinking like even even if it's hypothetical like this piece that lauren's talking about of having a listening space and like where would the where might even if it's just to help in a more administrative a more administrative process sense rather than necessarily then being an accumulation of wealth why where might some of these types of methods be thought of to help show what is happening that's working more or less in the type of thing that lauren's talking about if it was hypothetically to scale could be interesting i mean i don't know if they're two things are completely unrelated but you know um it, is there a way for it to be a kind of a monitoring evaluation and learning um bridge between value yeah, yeah there, there there's a there's an actual a, a recent a very recent protocol it was created like three four months ago called retroactive public goods funds so that where uh, you 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 engage in, in, in the optimism layer two, um, uh, they they are actually incentivizing you to inscribe your project in that in the sense that uh, if you already put your energy and in, in you and you track you have a track record of your investment to create this public good. This is for the commons, right? Uh, they are, are allocating funds in a match funding, the quadratic funding way, uh, for you to be recognized. Mm. That, that your energy to be recognized, that the energy that you put there to make that happen. That's a very audacious and ambitious thing. It, it is happening. Like, uh, well, uh, let's put TB. All the energy that should be put in the creation of Sensorica, it can actually be Sensorica itself and all the energy that he put and others can be uh, recognized and receive matching funds from these rounds around the optimism, right? And they are retroactive in a sense that they valid, they recognize if TB has, and TB has because there's the NRP there, the track record of things that he put in the energy to create. So, and, and all different sorts of networks and communities around the collective optimism will look at this and say, hey, this is very valuable. What Sensorica is doing extremely valuable. 
I, I, I want to contribute. I want to contribute a dollar. Because in the case of quadratic fund, it's not the quantity of money, you know, it's, it's the quantity of people and how the people are related to, to, to this ecosystem. So in, in that sense, Sensorica starts to have a relationship, right? Uh, through, uh, starts to have it through the retroactive uh, public goods funds and starts to be seen as a source of a public good in the eyes of the, you know, of, uh, through, the, through the lenses of refi, through the lenses of optimism as a public good. And what that means, it's always having grants rounds, right? It's like uh, almost monthly. So you, you, you generate a, a way to, um, to, to access uh, crypto and crypto that, uh, that uh, is, is, is uh, we have facility to transform, to transform it in fiat money if you, if you need, right? Mm. And, and I, uh, I've got one suggestion in there though as well, because this is one thing that's coming up in the evaluation world is, because what they found is they looked at these places and they said, okay, we've got, you know, we'd go around and you have all these projects and people get reviews on projects and this one's amazing and this one's amazing and that would get funding to go forward, right? So then they did a whole audit and they went through and they said, okay, let's look at all the organizations that are out there, what evaluations they got. And then they looked at how good their next project was and they found there was absolutely zero connection between the evaluations on the past and the future. Oh, you're going to hit the road. That's like serving well, well. dinner. <laughs> dinner time, bye. All right, take care. See ya. Laurie is going. Bye bye, Laurie, my dear. Yeah, take care. Bye bye. bye bye. So let me just ask one question on that is, so what they're trying to turn it round to is like, not how much did you do in the past? Because that's gone, right? Well, that's there. Is how much learning has come from that, either and particularly even from learning from what didn't work, that will help the future. And there's a value there. And I think one of the things that Sensorica has got is it's building on. It's not necessarily aggregating because you you can also get into that capitalist system of like the people that got loads of funding could put in more work, and then they can get more funding. They can put in more work, right? So there's a kind of like there's a kind of like a um, uh, a compound kind of growth but the question becomes is where is the value the learning that's going to drive the better work going forward for maybe less resources and that's um sort of tied to optimism but it's like and trying to get some sort of um and this is also the challenge with values like it's presumably you've got to try and you're trying to move it into what metrics right you're not even going from where to what you're going from what to the metric on the what right <laughs> but Tracking that is what they're really moved towards in all the evaluation in Canada now, because they were finding actually that good, the fact that I did well in something in the past doesn't necessarily bode well for the future at all, because um, things change, right? And um, and you don't if you don't know why it worked or why it didn't work in some areas. And that yeah, might but, be... but, 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 but Stefan, in the case of what I'm just describing as example yeah. Yeah, of yeah. what is happening in the Web3 yeah, yeah. space, cybernetically speaking, with yeah. optimism in particular, yeah. uh, there's others, yeah. is that they recognized that uh, uh, that some, that the uh, indigenous Aboriginal people did and still do, but did in the past, very meaningful work for the yes. existence of our species. So this is one thought. There's others. Uh, so they they understand that um, uh, energy for us is 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 not is not infinite. It's mm -hmm. it's limited, and uh, it's a, it's a, energy is a very uh, in this sense a scarce um, resource in the sense that it's very it's valuable for us. Our bodies try to retain energy, right? Yeah. Uh, in the in, in evolutionary yeah, yeah. process. So, so their way of thinking is very interesting. Like, um, because in the actual society, massive society that we became, um, we don't value that. We don't, yeah. we only value things that has future in the present, uh, that yes. is attached to some financial, you know, compensa compensation. So this is, this is actually, you know, 
you're, you're, you're I generally. Agree. I think it's good. I mean, is it that we, <clears throat> is it the problem is that we don't value meaningfulness? See, this is the thing that the Aboriginal stuff is what they accumulate over that time is meaningfulness. Not always, though. Some of it might end up being dead ends, right? Just like anything else. But they are moving towards complex meaningfulness, which isn't easily metricized, right? Because, and I think that's what you're saying. But the thing is with the, the, the and I'm not saying it's not a good point and what they're saying, but what I'm saying is the trouble is, and you're seeing this a lot is, and this is how do we stop the capitalist system just coming in and trying to game that? I, um, and I think the ability she, to uh, learn and the ability to move forward. Chibi has, Chibi gone, Chibi gone. I was asking, are you going to ask Chibi, he has to Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, let's let's just end up here and we can continue a little bit more. So, yeah. guys, that was our WI today, and um, see you next week. Yes, <laughs> lots of things, lots of things happening, right, Stefan? Lots. So, of bye, bye. Yeah, 